Well, good afternoon, and thank you, everyone, for joining me today for another leadership dialogue session. I'm Wright Lasseter, uh, President and CEO of Henry Ford Health System and Board Chair of the American Hospital Association. And I am truly looking forward to our conversation today. Um, as we have a guest that comes from outside the four walls of the hospital and healthcare industry, uh, outside of our field, but um, has a amazing and impressive background and expertise in two areas of great importance uh, and of great interest to me. Uh, and those are uh, innovation uh, and health equity. Uh, both have deep roots uh, at Henry Ford Health System. And I'm really pleased to have uh, a really great conversation that I look forward to today. And I would say that uh, diversity at Henry Ford Health System is the foundation upon which we do so many things. It's the foundation upon which we stand. And uh, we frankly want our actions to both directly and indirectly influence equitable delivery of care, as well as inform our organizational priorities. Uh, as an organization, we're deeply committed uh, to innovation, uh, both corporately and, and clinically, as uh, we continue to look for ways to improve the practice of, of medicine. Um, we partner with researchers, patients, healthcare providers, and the community at large uh, to meet the needs of a very diverse population um, and to develop opportunities to provide healthcare uh, for all individuals uh, working to eliminate disparities in, in healthcare. And the alignment for us uh, with our organizational priorities uh, and frankly with my personal passion is why I'm excited to introduce today's guest, Marcus Whitney, um, who we'll get a chance to speak with. Uh, Marcus is the founder and partner at Jumpstart Health Investors, a firm that's focused on uh, innovation and uh, investment within healthcare. Uh, Marcus is also the managing director of Jumpstart Nova. Uh, which is uh, a newly launched uh, venture fund uh, and will invest in Black-led and focused uh, healthcare uh, businesses. Uh, in addition to uh, financial backing, uh, Jumpstart Nova uh, is a pretty amazing organization that provides mentorship uh, and relationship building to, to companies within its portfolio to help accelerate growth, uh, to improve chances for success, and impact on equity and healthcare uh, in the community large. I'm proud to say that Henry Ford Health System has invested and become a limited partner uh, in the launch of Jumpstart Nova uh, as an additional way for us to uh, demonstrate meaningful support uh, for organizations like Marcus's um, and what I hope will be sustained change in the communities that we serve. So, so Marcus, let me just thank you again for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your presence today, and um, let's just get started with uh, with our rapid fire questions. Uh, but again, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, really excited to to chat with you. So, um, you know, I mentioned Marcus in the introduction that innovation is important to me, and it's important to Henry Ford. And you know, we're always looking for ways to evolve and improve our care delivery. Uh, can you just start by sharing a little bit with uh, our audience about your background uh, with Jumpstart Health and uh, insights you have about investing in, in healthcare innovation? Yeah, absolutely. So, so my, my personal background is I'm a technologist. I was a chief technology officer of multiple um, uh, technology companies, mostly in the marketing space. And I kind of got into the healthcare space by building um, an ad and marketing platform that was HIPAA compliant specifically for use by providers, trying to figure out how, to, you know, we're in the digital age, we've got social media, we need to still be able to reach people with our brand and our patients, but we operate under different rules than the typical uh, consumer-based brands that are out there. And so built a platform for that. And that really exposed me to, you know, some of the different rules by which the healthcare industry um, operates. And so, you know, the healthcare industry, I think often kind of gets a bad rap around innovation because, Clearly, you know, when you look at diagnostic devices or, or therapeutics or, you know, all th those types of things, the standard of care um, has been advanced mightily over the last hundred years. It's, it's, it's incredible life expectancy and the diseases that we've been able to, to, um, to, to handle. And then certainly, you know, our most, our, our most recent breakthrough of the, uh, of the vaccines uh, for COVID-19, just absolutely unbelievable achievement. That's all, that's all absolutely innovation. Um, I think what people are usually looking at is sort of the cost versus outcome, uh, you know, um, situation, right? And, and a lot of that is baked into policy and baked into um, a financial system around how we pay for care 
that is very, very difficult to unwind. You know, something that got started in the 60s and, and at this point is just very, very difficult to unwind. And so it's it's challenging to come up with innovation in the way that we deliver care when the way that we have at least traditionally paid for care for a very, very long time doesn't really um, uh, incentivize uh, the kind of innovation that we believe we need. And so specializing in health innovation has been something I've been working on with my partners at Jumpstart Health for the last seven plus years. Um, because it is a it's a different rule book uh, than you have in in other industries uh, where they're not as highly regulated, where you know the the stakes are not lives. Um, you know you do need to 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 I think be a lot more careful in this industry when you do innovate uh, and when you do make changes. And and so that's part of what we what we face in this industry. But having said that, we shouldn't. Uh, we shouldn't fail to try, right? We, we need to continue to have conversations um, with the clinical workforce, with the administrators that, that operate health systems, physician groups, um, you know, primary care organizations, et cetera, to, to learn and figure out what the needs are, what are the areas that are low hanging fruit and one of the moonshots and how do we you know, try to attack both, quite frankly. Um, how, do, how do we you know, create opportunities for outsiders to learn and to come into this industry and bring new ideas and bring new concepts and bring, and bring new um, you know, models for how we might be able to execute and then underneath all of that, you have to have capital. Um, you know, the, the cost of operating a technology business has dramatically dropped over the last 20 years. There's no question when you look at cloud technology and, and how far software has come and mobile devices, the cost of operating has significantly dropped. However, to actually operate inside of healthcare, there are those compliance requirements. There, there are just the need to have humans working in your organization, communicating with the humans that are working in the healthcare industry. So there is a capital barrier that's necessary for innovation. And so that's why I feel very fortunate that I get to work in the capital um, allocation business in healthcare, uh, probably one of the most meaningful places you can work in America today. Well, as I listened to you uh, talk a bit about uh, your background and focus, there's so many different uh, places we could go, and and um, we're going to keep this leadership dialogue to about 20 minutes, uh, but we could easily extend it to two hours um, based on on several things you said. Uh, let me just ask you a little bit about um, uh, the term uh, disruption. You know, you talked a bit about um, your background and and that you weren't born and bred in the healthcare industry. Um, you you came out of marketing and technology. You also talk about how the cost of running a technology company has dropped significantly in the last couple of decades. Unfortunately, uh, those of us inside the healthcare field wouldn't say that the cost of running a healthcare company uh, delivery and or and or insurance has dropped dramatically in, 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 in uh, the last two decades. But tell me a little bit about uh, lessons from outside the healthcare industry that you think the hospital field can can uh, can learn. Uh, uh, so folks like yourself that are that are getting into the healthcare space and helping us uh, with disruption and and increasing efficiency and using technology in smarter ways, et cetera. Just, just give, give us some perspective uh, from your vantage point. Yeah, so I, I think one of the things that, uh, that has been needed for a very long time, and we are now starting to see, and, and quite frankly, uh, Henry Ford, I think, is one of the leaders in this, uh, is developing an innovation practice. Um, you know, and that doesn't mean having a single person that's working in your organization that has the title of innovation, but in actuality, doesn't really have any pull, can't actually um, you know, uh, command any resources behind what they're doing, can't actually pull on clinicians to become champions for different innovative uh, you know, opportunities. Uh, you have to actually develop a practice um, alongside your standard uh, operating model. Um, and and th they have to be integrated in such a way that the innovation has an understanding of the challenges that the operational side has, and the operations has a respect for the innovation practice and understands that it actually is there to help, not to interfere, not to interrupt. Um, you talked about the word disruption. That that word, as, as you were, um, you know, describing it, it was, a, was a term coined by Clayton Christensen, uh, the late Cl Clayton Christensen, uh, in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. And it really is meant to, to describe when a value network of an existing business model um, is, is uh, disintermediated by a, a completely different value system uh, and value network that doesn't really uh, play by the same rules. The reason why we have not seen that kind of disruption happen in healthcare is because the rules are very, very strong in healthcare. They're, they're set by the government uh, and there's really, really steep penalties for breaking the rules. Uh, this is not true in the media business. And so this is why the media business got massively disrupted. 
Um, this is not true in, in the music business, and this is why the music business got massively disrupt, disrupted. But it is true in the healthcare industry. And so I actually don't think a lot of the things that we've learned in other industries as it pertains to disruption are great analogs for healthcare, to be completely honest, because of the regulatory apparatus is much, much different in healthcare. I think it's more akin to the, you know, to the airline industry, right? High availability, high stakes. Things really can't go wrong very often in these industries, right? And so, but you still have to move things forward. You still have to try to lower costs. And also the healthcare industry um, is an industry run by people. And, and I think the people who are served by the healthcare industry, the patients want it that way. I don't think you have patients who say, you know, I wanna deal with a robot. I want things to be automated. In almost every other area, we're fine with that. You know, we don't, we're, we're totally cool with at parking garages, not having to pay a person and just having it work on our phone or tolls or any of those kinds of things. But we don't feel the same about healthcare. When things go wrong, we want a person there to talk to us, to explain to us what's going on and to hold our hand. And so that's why that co the cost of operating a healthcare business continues to go up because cost of living continues to go up because wages are continuing to go up. So we're just a running by a different set of rules in healthcare. And that's why I think people specializing in healthcare innovation are so important because you have to have that context. When we have seen people from outside of the healthcare industry come in with the same lens of innovation and that word disruption that you've used, we've seen them run into a lot of walls um, without the proper understanding and respect for some of the, the, the challenges that are, that are there on purpose, uh, right? You know, to make sure we don't do harm unintentionally. I appreciate that response. Um, let's pivot a little bit to talking about uh, impact investing. Um, so clearly uh, your organization has a focus um, and it's it's both broad and narrow um, in the sense of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, maybe just talk to to uh, the listeners of, of this dialogue a bit about the impact that investing and providing venture capital uh, to minority led innovators from from black and, and other historically underrepresented groups can have on the future direction of, of healthcare. Uh, and so share, share some examples of the kind of work that you all have focused on, the kind of innovation that Jumpstart Nova is supporting. Yeah. So you know, the, the way that I see it right is, is that um, healthcare, uh, collectively as an industry, largest employer in the country, um, you know, largest segment of the GDP, uh, three trillion in spend a year and going up. Um, and every single, you know, person in this country uh, is a user of this system, okay? And so it, it's, it's as close of an industry as we have to sort of a universal fabric, um, that, that we have in, in any industry, uh, quite frankly. And so the idea that when you then look at the leadership, and specifically I'm talking about boards, management teams, capital allocators, and the people who receive capital from capital allocators. When you look at that group of those, those four segments and you don't see the requisite, the requisite diversity that represents that workforce, that represents the patients, uh, that represents the people who are spending all that money on healthcare, then you, you have an inherent problem, right? And, and you're going to end up having these health equity issues that we're now finally shining a light on, right? Because everybody is not at the table. You're missing key perspectives. You're missing key lived experiences. You're missing key voices who are gonna be able to advocate for certain communities at these levels of leadership. Um, furthermore, you, you're also limiting where all the great ideas can come from for the entire industry. One of the things that I think uh, I, I've had to talk to people about consistently since first imagining Jumpstart Nova is trying to sort of uh, say that, yes, certainly, because we are investing in black founded and led companies, there's no question we are going to invest in some founders who are going to have uh, unique qualifications and lived experiences to be able to deliver solutions that are critical for communities of color, specifically communities of, of black people in America. There's no question about that. And, and most people expect that that is truth and that is the focus. What they don't then expect, um, you know, I, I might look at you and say, you know, they don't then expect for us to be able to invest in founders who can create great solutions for the overall healthcare industry, right? Mm -hmm. um, and 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 what what kind of loss are we are we not calculating that we're missing because we haven't included? all people at the table to provide solutions for all people. You know, are we potentially missing some great founders with some great ideas that could help everybody? 
I believe the answer to that is yes. And so I, I kind of think our fund has a has a dual mission. Certainly, we believe we'll probably out index most uh, healthcare venture funds when it comes to creating companies that will focus on communities of color. We have one company called Drugview. They are focused on uh, being an overall life life uh, uh, life cycle platform for people with autoimmune diseases, um, but with a particular focus because they've been so underrepresented in clinical trials and research, and and therefore the outcomes have been worse uh, for for diverse populations. Um, you know, autoimmune diseases um, uh, are, are predominantly uh, uh, diseases that, Im that impact women, um, you know, more than 50%. Um, and certainly, you know, communities of color don't have the same outcomes, don't have the same access to clinical trials. And so while Drugview is a platform that is for all people with autoimmune diseases, their, their initial focus and they have a specialty uh, in terms of their ability to connect with these communities uh, is, is in these diverse populations. At the same time, we're invested in a company called Cellevolve, and the founder, uh, Darrell Porter, he's an MD, MBA from Penn. Uh, he started his career at McKenzie, and then he spent 20 years in the pharma industry in senior leader, leadership positions at AbbVie, Amgen, Gilead, and across that time, learned about cell therapies, learned about commercialization, and he is really uniquely qualified to, to lead a company that's going to show us how to create a platform for commercialization of cell and gene therapy, something that, that has not yet happened uh, in the entire pharmaceutical industry. That's gonna help everybody, right? And, and he just happens to be the person who is uniquely qualified to do it, and that person happens to be black, right? And so you, you, we're gonna have the benefit of investing in both types of founders, which you know, makes me really happy. So, you know, as I listen to you talk a bit about what you're doing, the impact you're making, uh, the way you're approaching it, and again, I'll just restate that uh, we could have uh, easily a two-hour conversation, um, uh, but I know our, our listeners will pop in for a, for a quick hit. So, so I'm going to, let me just close with, with, with this. Um, and you've alluded to this earlier. I mean, we know that data shows that um, at times, it can be impossible for 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 black and minority-owned businesses to secure investment, uh, no matter how promising the technology or service might be. But oftentimes, investors work with with um, folks that they know, um, um, folks that they're familiar with, which can shut out new entrants. Um, and so, you know, I'd say that the, the bias, whether conscious or unconscious. Um, and reinforce existing behaviors and can add to, to, to that challenge. And so let me just end, end our dialogue today with, uh, with giving you an opportunity to just sort of share any last thoughts on how supporting these companies, these researchers, these innovators directly and indirectly can have on the potential um, to reverse inequalities and inequities and improve the overall health status of, of all Americans. Yes, so right, we have a long way to go in terms of equity and capital allocation. Um, the, the good and sad news is that uh, following the, the, the tragic murder of George Floyd, uh, there was an awakening on this topic. And, uh, you know, I would say for the last year and a half, there has been progress in this area. So we are seeing more capital flowing into diverse founders um, than we ever have in the history of the venture capital industry um, over the last year and a half. I do believe that um, the launch of Jumpstart Nova and, you know, the incredible group of organizations that are our limited partners um, is a good representation of that. Uh, I also can tell you that the interest I am seeing from other venture firms that are interested in learning about the deals that we have and talking about co-investing with us is also very, very encouraging. We have a long way to go. We're not going to fix something uh, in an industry that's been around for over 50 years in a year and a half. Um, but I am encouraged by the progress that I'm seeing and would just encourage everybody to keep it up. Well, Marcus, again, um, I just want to thank you for joining me today um, and for sharing your insights on how uh, you can drive innovation uh, within, within healthcare uh, and outside of healthcare, but how specifically you and your organization are trying to drive healthcare to, to address inequities, um, inequalities, and disparities across, uh, across the country and are focusing on driving care for all, for all Americans. I mean, clearly, a key priority um, of the work that you described is. Uh, is in the AHA's wheelhouse, is in the American Hospital Association's wheelhouse, is in the Institute for Diversity and Health Equities uh, wheelhouse around trying to increase diversity, uh, increase inclusion and representation among senior uh, executive leadership and governance within hospitals and health systems. We talked a bit about, about issues within the boardroom and how that can, can impact decision making and capital allocation. 
Um, so clearly, uh, the AHA is working uh, to help support our industry around those activities. And as, as we close, um, I'd like to give a, a quick plug to AHA's uh, Accelerating Health Equity Conference uh, that's being held later this spring. Um, and so we, we would invite folks to Cleveland uh, the second week of May, May 10th through the 12th, where we'll bring together professionals focused on improving community and population health and those striving to achieve equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion, um, and and social justice. And again, let me just say that um, it's my pleasure to have these leadership dialogues. I get an opportunity to spend a little bit of time with some amazing individuals like Marcus Whitney, uh, as he described the work that his organization is doing. Um, thank you for joining us uh, today, and we look forward to uh, our next leadership dialogue. Thank you so much, Wright.